Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today I'll be discussing ijtihad. Ijtihad in fatwa. Ijtihad is one of the most talked about subject of Sharia in Islamic law. And uh, it is uh, in a way the end goal of the discipline we are engaged uh, in discussing the subject of usul al-fiqh. If one were to provide a short definition of usul al-fiqh, it is a methodology that encourages and regulates the exercise of ijtihad. Ijtihad is also the principal vehicle of reform of Islamic law. Combines the interests both, both of continuity and change, and it's uh, uh, highly recommended that uh, it is not uh, to be neglected. The position of the Mazahib on Ijtihad is that it is a collective obligation or fard kifai of the community not to discontinue Ijtihad. I'll be looking at the meaning and definition of Ijtihad. It's the methodology of Ijtihad and decline of Ijtihad and Ijtihad in contemporary issues and briefly how to uh, position ishtihad vis-a-vis -vis fatwa. There are some other topics and these are actually uh, there is, uh, I'll be using uh, my two chapters, one in principles of Islamic jurisprudence, the other Sharia law and introduction. Both of these have a chapter on ishtihad. The first one is more explanatory. This one raises contemporary questions about ishtihad and in fact provides a new definition for ishtihad. But uh, as a, when I said that it is the most talked about subject of Sharia, uh, it is due to the decline of ishtihad. People oft ask questions. Why is it not being practiced as much? Why is it not an engaging process? Um, of legislation in lawmaking in our times. Many have said it is because the conditions that must be fulfilled by a mujtahid are too demanding. Others say that it is the continuing hold of imitative scholarship in taqlid and that still holds back ishtihad. And, uh, background history. There was a time when uh, scholars spoke of the closer or closing of the gate of Ijtihad, Sad, sad Bab al Ijtihad. Uh, some difficulties also arise due to the fact that uh, the Usul al Fiqh is a discipline and the theory of Ijtihad. They predate the national state. Uh, which is 17th, 18th century Europe phenomena. And they did not uh, provide for uh, legislation, parliamentary legislation, a formula that could relate directly to the experience of lawmaking as we have today. In fact, uh, statutory legislation itself is a handicap for ijtihad in the sense that uh, the law book uh, defines the position the judge must take and the need therefore is diminished for the judge to consult the sources of Sharia directly. Ishtihad did suffer a decline but there was also a time at the turn of the 20th century when prominent ulama Muhammad Abdu and his disciple Rashid Rida and Jamaluddin al Afani, and they issued a renewed call for the revival of Ijtihad. It has not been discontinued, nor has it ever come to a standstill, but it is also uh, the results of that call, 
over a century ago. We have seen some good results, but of a limited type. Fatwa in Ijtihad differ in the sense that Ijtihad is more substantive juridical methodology or doctrine compared to Fatwa. Ijtihad must explain its evidential basis uh, in the Sharia and also it, uh, Ijtihad is not in the form of just de delivering an opinion. A fatwa can consist only of uh, opinion, agreement or disagreement, whereas Ijtihad explains its evidential basis. Neither of them is a binding command. Ijtihad in fatwa consists basically of juristic opinion. They are still open to further deliberation and the person to whom they relate to still have the choice either to act on it or not to act on it. Um, ijtihad literally means striving, making an effort. It comes from the root word jahada, ijtahada, to try, to strive. And this is uh, in the substance of ijtihad. It is defined in the classical works of Usul al-Fiqh as total expenditure of effort by a mujtahid, a person who is qualified to carry out ijtihad, in order to infer with a degree of probability and the rules of Sharia from their detailed evidence in the sources. The sources mainly refer to the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, there are two type, uh, two points perhaps to this definition. One person who carries out ijtihad must be qualified, must fulfill certain qualifications. And second, that he carries out this in his individual capacity. It is a broad concept. Historically, although we say that the usul al-fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence is all about ijtihad. It is a methodology for ijtihad from beginning to end. Yet, this is a broad, in a broad sense. No particular procedure has actually been specified for ijtihad. Although there are suggestions, as I will elaborate, and uh, no locus of authority in the state machinery has been identified. Its relationship with statutory legislation also remains something that has not been very clearly worked out. The qualifications that a mujtahid must fulfill, uh, five or six qualifications. One, he must be knowledgeable of uh, the Qur'an in Sunnah, and the usul in the furu of fiqh in the positions of ijma, the usul al-fiqh, and then the substantive uh, Islamic law in its various branches. Uh, he must know Arabic, must be knowledgeable of, uh, of the custom and conditions of society. He must be an upright person. Most of all, that he must have the ability to formulate independent judgment. Must be also knowledgeable of the goals and objectives, maqasid of the Sharia. It is, uh, however, not enough. Uh, we have had difficulty to identify mujtahidun. If I ask the question now, how many mujtahids are there in this country? in Malaysia or in any other Muslim country. We would not know for sure. The reason for this is that we have not identified a methodology or a procedure. How we know the existence in, of which they had and whether they are or not qualified. It is interesting. Al-Ghazali, a towering figure of Islamic law and thought, wrote in his uh, uh, one of his uh, works on Usul al-Fiqh, 
that uh, the mujtahid in our time is extinct. Uh, many centuries later, a 19th century scholar, al shawkani uh, explained this, of course, it is a kind of uh, the modesty of the prominent ulama that they do not declare themselves that I am a mujtahid. And interestingly enough, it is due to the same reason al shawkani said, did he forget himself? He was a mujtahid, and yet he went on record to uh, make that statement. The point I made that uh, the qualifications demanded of a mujtahid are rather onerous. To this al shawkani has responded, they are not difficult and they are not by any means excessive. It is a number of other factors and he has actually recounted, given names in every generation successively that Mujtahidun always existed and they have conducted Ijtihad. But it is to due perhaps in our time to the prevalence of secularism in the hold of secularity over the institutions of state in the fact that we now recognize the statute book as the only authoritative source of law in the land that we have not actually left a room space for either the mujtahid or the ishtihad that he carries out but it is possible to integrate into ishtihad into processes of lawmaking parliamentary legislation in modern times. As I would explain, uh, contributions have been made as to how this can be realized. It is not beyond the capabilities, for example, of uh, the universities and legal professions to combine their resources and to, uh, to design uh, perhaps uh, courses uh, of training, how mujtahidun can be trained and identified. This can be achieved by designing programs that combine the study both of, uh, of traditional and modern disciplines, as this has been done and attempted in many, many universities, Islamic universities, uh, yet need to be renewed and revised. And we are actually engaged in that process in so many ways, especially after the revival and resurgence, uh, Islamic revival, Islamic resurgence. The thought came to us, how are we going to make our law in government to reflect our own heritage? And uh, I will be making comments uh, as to how this can be made. It was, uh, this can be done, Abdul Wahab Khalaf, a well-known professor of Al-Azhar of 20th century, uh, he made the remark that uh, in our history, Ijtihad was not an official function. Mujtahidun did their work away from the influence of government, uh, but now that government has such an expansive influence in hand in almost every sphere of uh, activity in education and training, uh, the government must play a, a role in design, certification in diploma programs for the training of mujtahids. The theory of uh, ijtihad uh, entrusts this to the mujtahid as in his individual capacity. But now we have moved from that position. Ijtihad must now be a collective endeavor to be entrusted in, according to Muhammad Iqbal, into the Muslim Legislative Assembly. His suggestion is that we now have no alternative but to entrust the Muslim Legislative Assembly with both the power of ijma to formulate consensus and also uh, ijtihad. It is uh, due to the sheer growth 
in, uh, of, of the fields of disciplines of, and knowledge. No one individual can qualify. Uh, and uh, the suggestion also has been made that uh, we do not necessarily entrust uh, this task to the faqih in the ulama of sharia, but to include learned uh, individuals and groups from other disciplines that are important to the society, contemporary society. And I have uh, written that we should amalgamate ijtihad with the Qur'anic principle of consultation on shura and make this a consultative collective endeavor. Uh, it is uh, also ijtihad been understood as a juristic concept due perhaps to the fact that uh, historically uh, Sharia as a discipline dominated almost all other disciplines of Islamic studies and therefore Ijtihad was understood as a juridical concept but this as I have uh, suggested need not be the case perhaps in our times uh, we may have cause to move from this particularity and open up the scope of ijtihad. After all, ijtihad is in the nature of striving, of research, of making an effort to find a, new, a solution to new issues confronting society. And these issues are not only now legal and juridical issues. Uh, there is no reason, for example, that a Muslim scientist or economist uh, cannot conduct ijtihad in his own field of specialization provided that he is knowledgeable of what we specified of the Quran and Sunnah and uh, have the capabilities to carry out ijtihad in his own areas of concern. It is a methodology of finding solutions to issues and that is how I understood. In that light, I have also attempted uh, a, 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 a new definition that uh, make adjustments to the existing definition of Ishtihad and tries to encapsulate some of these new ideas. And uh, in this book, uh, I have uh, given this. It is uh, Ishtihad is uh, <coughs> a creative in comprehensive intellectual effort by qualified individuals in groups uh, to drive the juridical ruling uh, of a given issue, the hukum shari of a given issue from the sources of sharia in the context of uh, the prevailing conditions of society. There are several elements in this definition, perhaps four points that uh, to be noted. First, it is a creative intellectual endeavor. By this, it means that re reproductive effort uh, that merely uh, looks backward uh, and uh, is not creative would not qualify ishtihad. Uh, it relates uh, more intimately to the prevailing conditions of society today. Often we look into the fiqh books and try to uh, uh, relate it to conditions now. This is not, uh, uh, this is not where this definition would suggest. And then um, it is not uh, also a prerogative only of the scholars of fiqh and sharia, but other, as I earlier said, learned individual in different areas and disciplines that are equally important for our society today. Um, it is a comprehensive intellectual effort in the sense that uh, it is not confined to one or two particular disciplines. And then I said that uh, it is by qualified individuals in groups that would involve parliamentary groups and other institutions of learning and research who will also be included. In other words, we have departed from some of those 
uh, characteristics of the earlier definition of ishtihad to some fresh understanding. Of course, definitions are always open to revision and uh, I'm not claiming that it would be the best definition, but it's an attempt in that direction. Discussing the methodology of ishtihad, as I earlier said, the whole of Usul al-Fiqh is the methodology of ishtihad. Yet, in uh, the sense of a particular procedure, step by step, uh, we have not specified one particular procedure. Looking back at the early precedent, especially the period of the companions, uh, their way of exercising ishtihad in finding solutions to new issues was to refer to the Qur'an first and then to the Sunnah of the Prophet in his example. And if they did not find a solution, they would engage in consultation and uh, maslaha, deliver a ruling that would secure the benefit of society. This was their to characterize their approach toward ijtihad. Uh, then the next generation, the generation of the Tabi'un, uh, they faced uh, more complex issues due to the expansion of the territorial domain of Islam, the fact that Islam and the Sharia came in close contact with other well-established traditions, uh, the diversity of schools of thought and sects in various parts of the Islamic domains, and also the concern that many uh, lesser qualified individuals conducted ishtihad. Uh, this became a source of concern, for example, for Imam al Shafi, uh, who set about writing his Risala, for example, uh, to articulate the theory of ishtihad in the discipline of Usul al-Fiqh as he attempted in his works. There was a need for this methodology. Before that, this need was not so poignant at, during the time of the companions, but afterwards the need became uh, prominent for uh, developing guidelines for ishtihad. And then we have these two broad and comprehensive features uh, and positions taken. One by the Ahl al-Hadith, followers of the Hadith, the other by the followers of opinion Ahl al raya This bifurcation is by no means mutually exclusive. The Ahl al-Hadith exercised opinion and the people of opinion followed the Hadith, always. But this is a major kind of unified characterizations. In the uh, Ahl al-Raya, partisans of opinion camp, we have Imam Abu Hanifa, is uh, the principal advocate of Qiyas in Istihsan. As we discussed before, this was his contribution. His contribution in formulas for Ijtihad. Imam Shafi closely identified Ijtihad with Qiyas. He made a famous statement, Ijtihad is Qiyas and Qiyas analogy is Ijtihad, two words for the same purpose. In other words, he confined Ijtihad to analogical reasoning. And then we have other schools, the Maliki schools, who uh, advanced the theories of Maslaha, in uh, blocking the means or Sadd al zarai Imam Shafi himself in his school advocated the idea of presumption of continuity or istishab as a mode formula for ishtihad. And later, as I have written, some modern developments about most of these ideas in our times in 20th century suggestions have been added. And I have looked at some of them in our writings. Each mazhab, in other words, made a, a new contribution as to how to articulate uh, the formula of ishtihad uh, in accordance to their own 
methodologies, all designed to expound and articulate ishtihad. And yet we, today, we find that uh, most of their works, we are in need also to add our insights as to how to make ishtihad most relevant to our uh, own condition. Some of the other aspects of the methodology of ishtihad that I would briefly mention, but uh, the details I have written. One is uh, divisibility of ishtihad, whether it is divisible or indivisible. Is it a monolithic concept or can it be dismembered into different parts and segments? Majority of the Mazahib says that it is indivisible, monolithic. It is a caliber and the state of accomplishment of a particular individual who attains to the rank of mujtahid, and that uh, he cannot at the same time be a muqallid, an imitator. When you reach that level of thought and judgment and thinking, you cannot follow others. You cannot be at the same time these two things. And that was uh, the majority position, but in reality, Imam Ghazali and others, and we can take this different view that it is divisible. And due to the sheer bulk of knowledge, it is perfectly now um, feasible for uh, scholars to specialize in different areas of Sharia some in criminal law, some in jurisprudence, others in <laughs> inheritance, family law. Uh, and this is now happening. People do doctoral level studies and beyond in particular areas. So it is now um, that is the heart can be, uh, in other words, particularized. The question arises whether the Prophet himself carried out ishtihad. He was the authority. When he delivered a ruling, that becomes more authoritative than just ishtihad, which is a speculative opinion. Uh, but in reality, he has ca conducted ishtihad, especially in relationship to uh, military uh, and, and temporal issues and questions. And the classification of mujtahidun and muqallidun in different categories, I may agree or disagree with this, but there is this write-up that writers have, have classified the ranks of scholars into six or seven categories. One is mujtahid mutlaq, absolute mujtahid, comprehensive in all areas of the sharia, mujtahid fil sharia, also. And then uh, mujtahid uh, within the confines of a mazhab, mujtahid fil mazhab, uh, in one particular school of thought. And then below that, mujtahid in particular reference to particular issues, mujtahid fil masail, whether it is criminal law, inheritance, etc., etc. And below that, three or four other categories those who are cap capable of extraction of correct rules, ashab al uh, those who are capable of giving preference in, of some rules over others, ashab al those who are capable of correcting minor errors, ashab al uh, the identify what is the principal mainstream ruling in what is uh, the Zwahir or Rawaya in the Nawadir, the rare opinion, and so on. And then, of course, full-scale imitators, Muqallidun. As a matter of fact, the last four categories after the first three are all Muqallidun, all imitators, because they do not innovate. And then uh, <coughs> there is a discussion about the truth and fallacy of ishtihad. Question here is um, like the four mazhab takes the view that there may be several rulings of ishtihad on the same issue. Are they all true? And the answer given is no. 
truth is one, only one of the various uh, ishtihadi ruling can be uh, true and correct and others are not. Uh, but the Ash'ari, Mu'tazila and uh, others, they have maintained that uh, plurality of ishtihad, several ruling can be correct. And when you look at uh, the one hadith of the Prophet, it does seem as if there is some plurality accepted, that when the mujtahid uh, carries out ishtihad and he reaches the correct solution, he merits two rewards. But if he falls in error, uh, he still merits a reward. In the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا uh, those who strive in our path, we find we show them our ways. This is of course a general Quranic statement, but uh, there may be room for both of these opinions. Partially, perhaps correct, both of them. Then I discuss the decline of Ishtihad. After, until about uh, 15th century common era. Muslim scholars and ulama were able to uh, adapt uh, Islamic law in conjunction with the newly arising issues and to provide uh, necessary solutions uh, to problems of society. After that, in the last four century, centuries, that Islamic civilization uh, encountered weaknesses due to the challenges of Western civilization and uh, there has been a decline in ijtihad, in intellectual originality, kind of uh, the Western domination robbed uh, Islamic scholarship to some extent of their sense of originality and uh, self-image started on a in a declining course. The scholars of the era of taqlid, so to speak, of the era of imitation, they engaged themselves in writing in glossaries, in commentaries, in, uh, on the works of the earlier scholars and imams. And uh, originality of thought suffered a decline. And yet it was due to these reproductive works that they in the, somehow gave an aura of uh, sacredness to the works of uh, previous ulama and mujtahidun to the extent that uh, the mazahib uh, themselves became the vehicles of taqlid. So when the mazahib crystallized and became well established, they demanded uh, scholars to follow their, uh, their the rule, the school, uh, the school of thought to which they belong, and that also impinged on the on the horizons of ishtihad and the originality of thought. And the first uh, three centuries of Islamic scholarship are known as the era of ishtihad. Restrictions were less, and uh, after that. Uh, we have uh, developments I earlier referred to that uh, increasingly restricted the exercise of ishtihad. Then, of course, we have uh, colonialism. Colonialism and their domination, political and military domination uh, of the Muslim lands. The first uh, one of their priorities was to downgrade uh, the Sharia and to declare it, uh, only confine it to matters of personal law and then in so many other ways to replace that with statutory codes of Western origin. And as I said, statutory legislation itself and the phenomena of the nation state also presented difficult challenges for ishtihad. In the era of constitutionalism, you have an authoritative constitution and in most of the constitutions of 
contemporary Muslim countries, there is hardly a reference to ishtihad. Uh, the processes of lawmaking are defined and we are further removed from uh, the resources of our own heritage. And only in the 1960s we have this uh, reassertion of Islamic revivalist demands that we must bring back. And then we hear of uh, the revival of uh, Islamic form of government and state and gradually also uh, developments as I have explained. Islamic universities emerge, Islamic agendas of education, international conferences and uh, mm, there is a great deal of activity um, and a great deal of uh, constructive activity that tries to recapture uh, the originality of thought and leadership uh, that our scholars at one time enjoyed. The development of science and technology present challenges for ishtihad. We are falling behind because we don't relate. Ishtihad suffers and the gap develops so much that it becoming daunting uh, to attempt it. The longer this mm, gap remains and we have had it for about a thousand years as our historic uh, writing and uh, scholars tells us the era of taqlid lasted for about one thousand years uh, and, uh, and that also brought us face to face with this phenomena closing of the door of ishtihad then ishtihad in uh, contemporary issues i have uh, 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 elaborated a little uh, the point that uh, medieval era, the times, earlier periods were mainly the scholars were concerned uh, and uh, faced with uh, uh, a number of uh, challenges and issues that were on the whole predictable, predictable in the areas of marriage, divorce, inheritance, property, zakat, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, that predictability is no longer the case. Ishtihad uh, continuously is facing with new challenges uh, in the area of governance, for example. Uh, our fiqh books are very elaborate on personal status, marriage, divorce, and so on, but not so much on the exercise of political authority, on the exercise of coercive power by the state organs, uh, issues of uh, uh, financial products now, Islamic banking and finance, issues in science, in labor relations, governance. These are uh, areas wide open uh, of course, uh, 20th century scholars and after that, they have contributed and yet the scale of uh, the development in this course, it must be a continuous and engaging effort for Ijtihad to develop juridical rulings, for example, concerning uh, whether cloning is permissible in Islam whether this and that, all the time there are issues. In our own time, ishtihad, contemporary ishtihad, uh, is operated in three areas. One in the area of statutory legislation, I earlier mentioned. And yet ishtihad has been present even in this area. We have seen uh, Islamic family law reform of the mid-20th century. We have seen new uh, laws and codes of uh, personal status uh, in most Arab and Muslim countries um, uh, that uh, regulated polygamy and divorce uh, through attempting novel interpretations of the Quran and the sources of Sharia in such a way to deliver different solutions. Polygamy was subjected to new restrictions, and so was divorce. 
to preserve the integrity of the Muslim family in times of modernity, in modern challenges. Um, the second manifestation of contemporary ishtihad has been through the issuance of fatwa. Uh, we have seen collection of fatwa, uh, like every prominent uh, sheikh of Azhar, last thing that uh, he writes even after retiring is a collection of fatwa, two, three, four, five volumes of fatwa that and these contain a great deal of our originality in ishtihad and their contributions are on record. And uh, thirdly, the third manifestation of ishtihad in our times are of course uh, works of scholarship by individuals and institutions. Muhammad Abdu invited attention in his call for the revival of Ishtihad uh, to two aspects. One, greater attention should be paid to, uh, to the conditions in Urf, custom of society, and to Maslah in the formulation of Ishtihad. His disciple uh, Rashid Rida also went on record to say that uh, we ought to focus attention, give greater attention to the maqasid in the hikmah, the wisdom of the sharia in the articulation of ishtihad. People know, often know what is lawful and unlawful, but they don't know what is the wisdom in the philosophy behind those. When you have a grasp of the hikmah, the wisdom of uh, the ruling, uh, then you have developed the uh, internal capability of transforming yourself in uh, your environment. To understand the hikmah, the philosophy, the wisdom behind the rulings of Sharia gives ishtihad a caliber of engagement that would otherwise be lacking. Muhammad, some of the contributions, reform proposals uh, made by Muhammad Iqbal, I mentioned already, we must of course uh, respect the contributions of the scholars and imams of the past, but we ought to recognize equally importantly our own responsibility uh, to uh, exercise originality and revise some of those positions in the way that uh, relate most meaningfully to our experience. And he highlights uh, issues in leadership, for example, and others have written that now fundamental rights and liberties uh, exercise, they pose issues uh, for contemporary ishtihad, the prevalence of dictatorship, democracy, the understanding of jihad vis-a-vis -vis, uh, violence and uh, extremism, uh, for example, gender equity and women issues, issues pertaining to the experiences of uh, the youth, the youth culture, the kind of exposure to modernity. Uh, these uh, frequently uh, pose new issues. Uh, a new engagement for uh, creative ishtihad. Uh, Muhammad Iqbal wrote that uh, apostasy, the theory of apostasy, as you read in the Hanafi book Hidayah, it calls for a revision. The Indian subcontinent, many Muslim women, they convert to Hinduism or because of the oppressive household and husband they don't find solutions from the Islamic family law, so they convert. Indeed, this is not what we should find adequate solutions to these challenges. Uh, lastly, fatwa in ishtihad. The difference between fatwa and ishtihad, as I earlier mentioned, uh, is that uh, ishtihad is a more substantive juridical doctrine. But uh, uh, fatwa 
also if we consider uh, fatwa uh, and differentiate it with judicial ruling a judge is only concerned with a set of facts and he must have evidence his judgment must be based on evidence the mufti is not confined the fatwa can be based on that evidence but also the ethical and theological principles uh, of islam also must integrate be integrated into fatwa ijtihad and fatwa if they both explain their own evidential basis then they are uh, interchangeable uh, the same fatwa literally means a response a qualified person a faqih may respond to a particular issue but the difference between ijtihad contains an original originality something that is new whereas fatwa can be uh, can have original component or it may be simply a reproductive effort looking at uh, existing evidence and providing a response uh, the fatwa need not have that original uh, component as ishtihad has it uh, in our time fatwa has become subjected to uh, changes uh, for one thing Uh, in many muslim countries it has become the mufti is a state functionary in earlier times this was not the case the muftis were like uh, advisors legal advisors working with the community if people needed advice in relationship to a particular issue or whether a court case or a family problem or other they would re- uh, refer it to a mufti and he would offer an opinion by way of making a contribution uh, that is no longer the case the mufti is an official uh, person and uh, uh, restrictions have been introduced also through legislation on the on fatwa making the ulama for example even in Muslim ka Arab countries in this country in Malaysia they are not free now to issue fatwas this must be uh, exercised by the Islamic religious council by mufti and then to be uh, endorsed and assented to by, by the sultan and then gazetted and then it becomes uh, an authoritative fatwa and when that becomes Uh, the kind of uh, when the, the all these processes are completed then fatwa is binding this uh, must be complied with it's almost another source of legislation now this has not been the case as I, as we understand in the theory of fatwa fatwa has in ijtihad they are both speculative in the sense that they don't bind anyone if they bind anyone is the mufti in the mujtahid themselves because they must speak out of their true conviction and their true conviction they must comply with it ethically morally but no one else is bound by that and they can ask for an alternative opinion they may not follow it but now we have changes uh, so many changes that uh, almost uh, influences the fabric of fatwa of uh, jihad in our times i have written in some of the articles that we ought to not move too far in that direction we ought to to recapture the 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 uh, the kind of openness of fatwa in jihad that scholars made contributions openly Uh, to issues of contemporary society of their time of course uh, a judicial decision is binding but uh, that is the difference between a uh, judicial decision qadwa fatwa in ijtihad the latter two are not binding the prevalence of course of uh, statutory legislation nowadays Uh, restricts the scope of both fatwa 
uh, in ijtihad. We have uh, in, in our history had this phenomenon, although I have never found it easy to accept. Uh, Sad Bab al Ijtihad, the closing of the door of Ijtihad around 5th or 6th century Hijra, a climate of opinion emerged. From now on, no more original thinking, follow the Mazhab. We are almost reaching that now. No more original fatwa, follow what is said. Uh, almost uh, closing the door of uh, original thinking in fatwa. I think that uh, benefits of introducing, and must, one must say this as well, or restrictions on fatwa, uh, is that uh, it uh, prevents arbitrariness, arbitrary opinion. Irresponsible scholars stand up uh, on Friday prayers and other places and deliver opinions that cause dissent and, and uh, misguidance sometimes and it becomes a source of uh, worry for ruling authorities. Uh, that has become a big issue now. One would never advocate that, but a responsible exercise of fatwa by qualified people, we should uh, open the scope. Thank you.